Welcome to Moments with Marianne. Before we get started in introducing our very special guest for today, I would just like to take a moment and wish everyone on the East Coast a safe passage wherever you're going. I hope you weather this storm. I'm in Raleigh, North Carolina, and I know how difficult this is. We're doing the best we can to prepare as much as we can. Make sure just to take a moment, reach out to your family and friends, make sure everyone's okay, and of course, reach out to your neighbors and see if they need any help as well. So our guest is very appropriate for today. We have Jenny Steinbolt is here to talk to us about her new book, Climate Wise Landscaping. Now, Jenny has been a gardener all of her life and earned her MS degree in botany from the University of Maryland. Her new book presents hundreds of practical actions to help homeowners and gardeners shrink their carbon footprint on every landscape. So let's welcome to the show, Jenny Steinbolt. Well, Well, thank thank you you very much for having me, Marianne. I really appreciate it. Oh, what a joy it is to have you here. And my goodness, what a profound book. It really had so much information. I learned so much reading it. Well, that's good. That's the whole point. (laughs) Well, so let's talk about this book and, you know, and your inspiration behind writing this book. Okay. Well, um, I have a co-author, Sue Reed, up in Massachusetts, and, and she's a landscape architect, and I'm a botanist in Florida. So while our backgrounds are different, we totally agree that we can do things in our landscapes right now to help with the climate, to either help your landscape survive the climate or to help wildlife like the butterflies um, and the birds survive climate or to actually mitigate climate change. So it's we, the subtitle of it is Practical Actions for a Sustainable Future. So it's a, a roll up your sleeves and let's get busy kind of book. Well, how exciting is that? Because I think right now, it's exactly what people are asking for. It's what they want. They're like, hey, you know, we can see how climate change is affecting different parts of the country or or maybe even my own backyard. How can I go ahead and start using, you know, like maybe different plants or landscape it in a certain way that supports that? Well, that, that's right. And, and there are so many things uh, that you can do. We have a hun- hundreds of ideas that we came up with that some seem like common sense, but some are going to be new ideas for people um, because we really did a lot of research to find out what was really going to make the most difference. Well, and so to kind of piggyback on, on that, uh, because, I mean, you're, you've got an amazing background as a botanist, where do you, how do you think that climate change has changed the way that we garden and landscape? Well, I'm, I'm hoping that it will change landscaping more than it has already. Um, they, we started the book with lawns because the way we treat lawns typically in, in uh, the United States in, in most places is that um, we've, try to get one kind of grass and nothing else and have it be greener than it's supposed to and and have it look like a carpet. But, you know, Mother Nature doesn't really agree with us. And so (laughs) one of the easiest things that we can do right off is to stop stop with the high-end, high-chemical input lawn care and let the lawns go natural. Um, so that they might have other plants in them. And so that, you know, sometimes there's going to be times of dormancy and that we can just have the lawn be more natural. Well, and then it can kind of have this more kind of a, I've seen um, these different yards before where it has this kind of wild but somewhat organized feel to it. Right. Yeah. Um, So that, and you would, and we also suggest, and it's a big suggestion, is to have much less lawn so that you're not spending so much time and effort mowing the lawn, but just keep a small area for play yard or outdoor entertaining or whatever. But the rest of it, we would suggest that you convert it to meadows or prairies or 
um, groves of trees, um, pretty much anything else besides lawn <laughs> is going to be better for the landscape. Well, and for those that need to have that small area, is there one type of lawn that's better than others? A freedom lawn. (laughs) So that that you let whatever grows grow. And it's going to be different down here in Florida because our weeds are not the same as yours. Um, So you may have more clover than I have. You know, I may have more sunshine mimosa. So that is going to depend upon where you are as to what else would grow with the original uh, lawn or turf grass that was that was originally put in. Um, but when you stop treating it with herbicides and when you stop over fertilizing it and over irrigating it, then the, the nature of the lawn will change. And so it'll just be more natural. Well, and why would we minimize the use of power tools? Because I know you talk about that in your book as well. And I'd love for you to share with our listeners why there's an importance to that. Well, the gas-powered power tools for lawn and landscaping for homeowners have a very high pollution uh, factor so that a a blow, you know, a leaf blower or... Um, A string trimmer actually pollutes the atmosphere more than a car by a lot um, because there's just no regulations. So we understand that you would need perhaps some power tools, but we would suggest that you convert to battery-powered tools because then you don't have that gas engine doing the pollution and, and the energy required for the tool would be more sustainably obtained because it would come from the outlets in your house. Well, that makes perfect sense. I had no idea until I picked up your book how much power tools really, um, how much, you know, emission that they actually produce. And so it's good to, to know this, especially if you're looking to go more green and, and you're concerned about how climate's affecting, you know, everything. Right. And, and actually the photos in the book of those battery powered tools that those are those are our tools in our household. So we have converted. My husband is very impressed with the chainsaw and the string trimmer and the leaf blower all operate on the same. And actually, his hedge trimmer too. They all operate with the same battery. So he's got multiple batteries. So when we're out doing a project, a long-term project, say with the chainsaw then you can bring an extra battery with you out in the landscape and then just change it out. And just have it work from there. So, um, and then in your book, you also talk about trees and shrubs. And I'd love for you to kind of expand on that. Like what's, you know, and I know this is different for everybody, but how would we um, determine what's a good tree to plant? (laughs) Well, we would suggest that you plant trees that are native to your particular area. And there are native plant societies in every state. And you can find a native plant society by going to uh, plantsocieties.org. And they have a, uh, a listing of all the plant societies and other organizations. Because the native plant societies will help you find the native plants. When you go into a big box store, those, those trees and shrubs there could come from anywhere. And they may or may not be the best ones for your climate. Or they may even be invasive in your area. So that in most states, there's no rules against selling invasive plants, which is so hard for me to understand because we're spending taxpayer and private funds getting rid of the plants that are overtaking our natural areas. So pe- that people are still selling them is <laughs> is really a sad state. Yeah, I had no idea that that practice was still happening because you would think if, if there's this movement to – keep things, you know, more like within your zone of what is natural within that area, then they would also say, hey, you know what, we're not going to allow these different stores to carry 
these other um, non-native plants. And, and the other thing about the native plants is that the native plants are the ones that service the butterflies and the pollinators and the birds because the plants and the animals have adjusted to each other over millennia. And so when you replace it with a plant from India, um, then that may not serve the, you know, may not provide the ecosystem services that a native plant has. So if we want to help with the butterflies, then we need to have more native plants. Even though a butterfly will visit a a non-native plant for pollen, it may end up not having a place to raise its young. So um, there are very specific needs for some butterflies, like um, monarch butterflies need milkweed for their larvae. They will not lay their eggs on other plants. And so there's a whole movement now to plant more milkweeds um, so that the so that the monarchs can migrate because they migrate from the northern parts of our continent down to Mexico to spend the winters, and they go through several cycles, and they need milkweed all along the way so that they can lay their eggs somewhere. Yeah, and what's interesting if if you don't know that's what the um, monarch butterflies need. A lot of people might think, oh, this is just some crazy looking weed that's in my yard when it's actually <laughs> beneficial to the, the monarch butterflies. Well, yeah, and, and we can educate ourselves. And, and this is one of the reasons that we wanted to write the book is for outreach to help people open their eyes to what is actually happening. Um, and, you know, sometimes our conventional gardens may be beautiful but they they don't if they don't service the birds and the and the butterflies then maybe we need to rethink what a beautiful garden should look like and what that's all about well and yeah. i know in your book you also talk about carbon storage you know when yes. we talk about trees and i'd love for you to explain what that is and why we should care about that Right. Well, it all goes down to photosynthesis in the plants because, and I know everybody studied this in school, but photosynthesis in a green plant, the plant takes in carbon dioxide, which is a greenhouse gas, and water, and it makes a sugar. So and the sugar is a carbohydrate, and then it will make more complex chemicals that it needs to form whatever parts that it needs um, but it all goes down to creating a sugar um, and so when plants perform photosynthesis they suck in the carbon dioxide and so that's how the carbon gets out of the air is with that photosynthesis and then the plant especially a large plant like a big tree will sequester that carbon in its, in its trunk and in its leaves and stuff because it's a carbohydrate-based life form. And when the tree loses its leaves in the winter, then the leaves go into the soil, and the soil also stores um, the carbon and the carbohydrates down there. So we need to plant more bigger trees, we go back to trees and shrubs, so that we can store more carbon in our own landscape. And the side benefit to having more trees in your landscape is that through transpiration, it will actually cool the atmosphere so that your landscape will be cooler, actually cooler, if you have more trees. And that's so, I'm so glad that you shared that as the, the benefit, because a lot of times people go, well, I'll get a little bit of shade, but is it really worth it if they're looking for a different kind of landscaping? But overall, if it helps with energy costs and keeps your area cool, why not? Well, that's right. Yeah. Um, and, we, and as far as the trees go, we would also recommend planting them in groupings so that there are several trees together and shrubs around them so that you don't plunk a single tree in the middle of a lawn because it's not good for the lawn and it's not good for the tree. 
Um, but if you have a thicket around the tree, so and if you have a lawn tree, then that's one way to reduce your lawn is to plant some shrubs and some bunching grasses and other things around that tree and take out that lawn so that the soil stays cooler and it becomes self-mulching and the plants are going to be happier um, when they're growing together in a grouping. That makes sense. And you don't often see that where they have groupings of trees. It's usually like, like you're saying, like one in a lawn, but yeah. it makes perfect sense why someone would do that. Well, I mean, it is, it is a typical thing. And, and down here in Florida, they plant magnolias in the middle of the lawn and the magnolias lose their huge leathery leaves all year round. And so it makes a huge mess. Um, so, yeah. so, so we, we say, well, plant some shrubs that will get along with that tree around the edge. And when those darn leaves fall down, that they just become mulch and we don't have to pick them up. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's interesting. Like in Colorado, aspen trees are very popular, you know, yes. and, and it's, and it's, uh, I find it always fascinating that that's one organism when you have multiple aspen trees growing up in a, in a little area. Yeah, though they're incredible um, plant organisms. Um, it really is very impressive. So across the country, people can find out what is native to their area. Your book's a really good indication of kind of how to find that and, and what things to look for when planting trees and shrubs in their area. And so I'd love to get to something that is really important for a lot of people, which is water. That seems to be such a big deal. Oh, it is. And one of the things in our research um, is that not only when we save water, not only do we save our precious resource of fresh uh, drinking water, but we also save energy because it takes energy to extract the water from wherever it's coming from and to deliver it to the tap in your house. And so when you save water, not only are you saving the water source, you're also saving energy. And when you save energy, then you're also saving the environment. You're, you're offsetting the use of the water. Um, you're offsetting the greenhouse gases by using less water in your landscape. Mm -hmm. So we would, we would want you to have natives because they're used to your climate and the way you get your rain. Um, and so you would have to re you wouldn't have to irrigate so often. Um, and climate change, look what's happening in California. Things are drying out. There's more fires. Uh, and on the other side, there's more rain. You know, huge weather events are happening. Um, the hundred year floods and stuff are happening every two years now because things are changing. And, but there's things that we can do right now. Well, and so when we talk about water, and, and I'm so glad that we're kind of talking a little bit about the drought-resistant landscapes, mm -hmm. what are some, you know, like tips for enhancing biodiversity in our landscape with that in mind? Um, well, you'd, you'd want to plant a, a lot of different plants, so, you know, so it wouldn't be just one kind of tree and, and one kind of shrub. It, it's better to have um, a diversity of different shrubs and different trees so that, again, you are supplying the ecosystem services for the birds to come in because one kind of tree will help one bird and another kind will help another. Um, and the same with the shrubs. But also... Many of the named cultivar shrubs are cuttings from one mother plant. So when you, when you buy a named cultivar, it's usually the same, it's a clone of the same plant. And so if you have five or eight bushes that are all the whatever that uh, cultivar is, it's really all the same organism. So there's no genetic diversity in that collection of shrubs. So we would suggest that you have some of your plants that are grown from seed so that the plants can actually adjust their own populations to, um, 
evolve with the with the changing climate. I think that's um, fabulous. And and so, would you suggest that they like where would people start with their seeds? Would that be something they get at their local farmers market? Are there special places they can order that from? Again, the Native Plant Society is going to be your best source for finding your diverse, genetically diverse uh, trees and shrubs for your area. Okay. They are going to know where to find them and who the who the growers are. Um, so, yeah, um, that that would be one thing. And then the other thing that we found was very interesting is that when you grow your own food on your landscape, that every pound of food that you grow um, offsets up to two pounds of greenhouse gases. So it's also a good education opportunity for your, for your kids so that they would figure out that carrots don't come in plastic bags. They actually grow in the ground. Yeah, I mean... Things were a little different when I was growing up. I mean, we grew a lot. We had a little garden, and so we grew a lot of our food. And you're right. I mean, nowadays, I don't think, you know, children understand where that comes from or how that all works. And, and I, I'm hoping that a lot of people who read the book take the food growing to the schools and to the churches so that whole communities end up growing a lot of their own food. And because... Every pound of food offsets two pounds of greenhouse gases, so it is better for our climate. And, of course, a fresh vegetable is much better for for you as well because it's fresher. It has more vitamins. Yeah, without a doubt. Well, and um, is there anything that, um, any, any last tip in regards to water that you would like to share with our listeners when it comes to maybe, you know, things they can do in their garden that would help the water absorb better? Oh, well, yeah, we, we talk about rain gardens and also talk about rain barrels. Mm-hmm. So a good climate-wise landscape would not give away any of its rainfall. Keep it all on the land so that you would gather some in rain barrels so that you have um, untreated water to use in your for your vegetables and stuff. So that And it's amazing how much you can gather from a rooftop. Um, and then... For the times when we have more severe rain is that you would have a rain garden and swales so that the water um, it gets, stays in there and some of it will soak down and replenish our aquifers. And, and uh, others would be, uh, much of it would be absorbed by the plants in the rain garden. Mm-hmm. So, that, so that, and you'd want to design the rain garden so that it would soak up the rain in the water in less than three days so that you don't produce a mosquito haven. Oh, yeah, that that makes perfect sense because that's the last thing, especially that can uh, have its own mess of issues if you have mosquitoes coming out. (laughs) Right, and the rain barrels should have screens over their tops wherever you're gathering the water so that the adults can't get in. But even if they do, that the, the juveniles that hatch cannot get out. So the, the rain barrel should never be a mosquito haven. Yeah, and moving it from there. And um, they also should probably check with their local area because I know um, a couple of years back, Colorado, um, it used to be illegal to collect rainwater, and, now, and they passed something, and now it's not. So it's interesting. Well, it's still, it's still limited. I think, I think in parts of Colorado you're limited to two rain barrels. Oh. So. Um, but yeah, was, the rain was spoken for before it hit the roof. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, so, but I think that people are wanting to conserve the water and that water from the rain barrels, um, doesn't have the chlorine in the other purifiers that our tap water does. So that means it's better for building your compost and it's better for the plants because it doesn't kill the microbes in the soil. And, the, and the, the microbes in the soil are what make it work. Well, and to talk about soil, so what are some of the common, like, urban issues that we can expect in city areas when it comes to soil? Well, um, first of all, we have to stop treating our soil like dirt. Um, 
um, because soil globally sequesters four times more carbon than all the plants and all the forests together, all the terrestrial plants. The ocean has a beat, but, but all the terrestrial plants, the soil stores four times more carbon than the plants. And so we need to be taking care of the soil. And that's one of the reasons that we started with lawn, because when you put the fungicides and the insecticides and all that other stuff on the lawn, it's very bad for the soil. And when it's bad for the soil, then the plants are not going to be so happy, which is then they go in and they put synthetic chemicals down so that the plants can eke out a living. Um, but the soil has been damaged. So that, that's one of the things that we talk about. And we want not to, not to um, disrupt the soil or minimize the disruption of the soil in our gardening so that we would not turn it over unnecessarily. And if you're growing vegetables, to use raised beds so that the underlying soil can continue to sequester that carbon. Well, and so for um, soils that might... Um, maybe aren't the cleanest or maybe, um, you know, or, or the tests for just being high in a toxicity, would you recommend that people, you know, get or do some type of mulching or something that would bring more organics into that soil or just leave it be and let it work itself out? Well, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd go ahead and mulch. Um, soil that has heavy metal deposits and stuff in the urban areas and the best best mulch is going to be uh, wood chips from tree cutters. Mm -hmm. So that if you're the tree cutter in the neighborhood, that is the greenest, most climate-wise mulch that you can get because it hasn't been packaged, and the, and the tree cutter is right there in your neighborhood. And he, if you take his load, then he doesn't have to pay a fee taking it to the dump. So there's all kinds of win-wins when you help uh, the tree cutters, um, you know, get, get rid of their loads of, of chipped wood. Um, but as far as growing vegetables in, the, in an urban area, uh, raise the beds. Don't, don't grow in the ground. Use a raised bed, and if it's significantly toxic, have the bed, the raised bed, be separate from the ground. Put a put a bottom in that in that uh, raised bed so that it doesn't touch the ground. Well, I think that's just great advice because you know people run into these issues and they're like, "Gosh, what do I do?" And you know, yeah. and, and your book really gives a lot of just kind of common sense advice when it comes to landscaping and gardening, and you know, and, and so it makes it easy for people to go, oh, "Okay, well, this is this is the right thing to do for not just for my." my property but for the the um the soil and the plants themselves yeah and, and we would encourage people to work on an, on a neighborhood wide basis so if you're creating more habitat in your area in your lawn area that the neighbor's doing it too and the community owned property if everybody's creating thickets for the birds and stuff then, then you're going to end up with many more birds in your neighborhood and many more butterflies than you would have had otherwise. Well, and so it kind of this brings me to my next question. When we talk about, is it you know, it's either at least when I hear like problems with gardening or landscaping, they talk about water, they talk about you know drought resistant, and then they talk about maybe how do you keep some of the, um, how do you choose like appropriate plants that also kind of keep a lot of the, the bugs away? And what are your thoughts around that? Yeah, um, there should be no landscape-wide poisons used because mm -hmm. uh, you end up with a poison cycle. And I, I talk about that in the book, um, that if you put a poison down to kill a pest insect of some kind, then you kill that pest insect and all the predators that would have eaten that insect either are killed as well or they go away because there's nothing to eat there. 
And then when the pest insect recovers, it's going to be worse because there's no predators there. So that you end up with a vicious cycle, and then sometimes the insects adjust to that poison, and then you have to change it to another poison or a higher dose of poison. Um, so that you end up with a, with a vicious cycle where the plants <laughs> themselves are actually injured. I also um, say, well, you know, somebody say, well, you know, you can just spray soap on the plants and get rid of the aphids. But if it gets rid of the aphids, it also gets rid of the ladybug larvae. And it also, that soap will also melt the waxy cuticle of the plant so that the plant ends up with fewer defenses if you do that. Mm. Well, so that, yeah. <laughs> it, 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 yeah, it doesn't, doesn't make any sense to do that. But you hear that's one of the common things that people think that they should do, which they feel feels like less harmful, but it, it's really not the way to go. It, it's, it's, it may be less harmful, but it's not. It's not. It's still harmful because a poison is a poison. And if it's going to kill one thing, it'll kill the other things too. So if you have an infestation of aphids on your milkweeds that you're growing for the, <laughs> for the monarch butterflies, then r- rinse them off with water. Uh, and because you don't want to poison the, the monarch butterflies because those are the caterpillars. So a true butterfly gardener cheers when her plants are eaten. <laughs> <laughs> well, for me, I would probably just go get more ladybugs, you know, that, and add them right. to my garden because I love them anyway. And that's then, right. you know, figured, well, hey, they're going to have a great feast on all these aphids. That's right. Kind of. So it's interesting because you, you can't add these, you know, these um, different you know, like adding ladybugs to our garden, there are other things that you can do that will help to increase the health of the garden as opposed to, um, you know, something that would would hurt it. Yeah, yeah, because it just ends an endless cycle if you try, if you step into that cycle. But there are things that you can do, integrated pest management, where if you're doing crops that you would rotate the crop family so that you plant one kind of, plant family in one bed one year and then the next year you plant it in a different bed so that the so that the nematodes that like that plant family aren't, aren't going to have anything to eat the next year mm-hmm. uh, uh, so and, and work with your extension agent because the extension agents know what the cover crops are that will help with um, with the soil borne um, pests that you may end up having within your edible gardens. Well, and when we talk about edible gardens, I know you have this whole section on harvesting wild edibles. And so yeah. what, what would be considered like a wild edible? Yeah, eat, eat the, the weeds. weeds. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, we have some caveats on that. One, if you are not 100% sure of the identity, don't eat it. Mm-hmm. Because a wild carrot also looks like a, a a water hemlock, which is highly poisonous. So they're in the same family. So unless you really know what, what it is, don't eat it. Um, the other thing is that if you are harvesting wild plants, don't do it on public property. Don't harvest plants for eating in parks or right-of-ways. Do it only on private property where you have permission to pick those plants. Um, Of course, some parks may end up with harvesting their weeds, um, but you don't want to go in there without somebody knowing that you're picking the plants. Um, The other thing that you can do is bring some of those weeds into your edible garden. And one of the ones that I like a lot is the wild garlic. And it, I think it grows where you are, and it, it's a weed. It's definitely a weed, and I, it's, it, but it is garlicky, and it has flat leaves rather than hollow leaves like chives. So it's in the garlic side of that, of that family. And 
planted it next to, I have it planted next to my chives. And so I have the wild garlic um, that I can eat, but I grow it now as, as part, one of my crops. Yeah, I, I mean, I've been on family property where they're like, oh, yeah, over there we have a bunch of blackberry bushes. You know? yes. So you know that they're not spraying it. It's, you know, you that's, have permission right. to go and and pick it and try to survive all the thorns, you know. So. Yeah, um, the, the brambles are a good example of, of – um, things that you can do on your property too because they probably in many places just would grow if you're not if you're not tending an area the brambles tend to take over in a lot of different areas but then they have fruit and if you don't eat it then the birds will eat it so it ends up being um, a good sustainable thing to have in your landscape and and I, I just like how that looks too it's got this very interesting look to it you know especially if you're going a little wild on your landscape it's got this fun diversity right and we we would we would suggest that you have some wild back corners of your landscape even on a small lot you can have a back corner where you would have some stick piles where you just pile the sticks in there and that way um, the um, native bees would have some place to to drill into and the birds would have shelter and that way you and you would eventually do less and less and less in a bat in that back 10 feet where you have a wild area yeah and the animals are able to um, spend a little bit more time there well and so what final thoughts would you like to leave our listeners with I, we just barely touched the information at climate wise <laughs> landscaping there's so much information in this book and and then there's even more that's not in the book. So I mean, it, once you get started, then you can make a real difference. And people say, well, just I just have one quarter of an acre lot. I'm not going to make any difference in climate at all. But there's millions of people with quarter acre lots, millions and millions. And so if we all work together, then it will make a difference. And that way, when it comes to climate issues, we're not just wringing our hands. We're actually being proactive. And we have more information on our website and we're on Facebook, but our website is climatewiselandscaping.com. And Climatewise Landscaping, we're on Facebook. And so we have a lot of uh, posts there as well. Well, I'm part of your community and I've asked everyone to um, do the same because it does, your book gives such great information, especially in today's age. We need to be more proactive instead of reactive when it comes to our landscape. So, you know, Jenny, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us here today and to share your new book, Climate Wise Landscaping. Thank, thank you very much, Marianne. Again, you can reach Jenny at greengardeningmatters.com, learn more about her, become part of her community, and also, of course, pick up her new book, Climate Wise Landscaping. Again, just want to wish prayers and thoughts for all of you. Make sure to check in on your neighbors and see how they're doing. This is really a community effort, and we need to hold each other up and help each other through this difficult time and this difficult weather. Well, we're at the end of our time today. I would like to thank each and every one of you for tuning in. You've been listening to Moments with Marianne. And remember, make every moment count. In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work. And while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Moments with Mary Ann airs every Thursday, Friday, and Sunday at 8 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Mountain Time. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmaryann.com for more information.